All right. Why are you shushing me? This is my job. You know what I mean? I'm in a meeting right now. I'm in a meeting. I've got, hold, 716 colleagues. This is a business meeting. We're talking about the new Prime strategy. All right. I'm not supposed to yell because, we, like I said, we have someone staying with us who is in a business meeting. And so I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to do the whole show ASMR. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Stan Show. Today is Thursday, September 23rd. And if you're watching this on YouTube, it's probably Friday, September 24th, unless my editor decided to quit. He's been really on edge lately because I keep giving him more videos to do. I'm not talking about Valorant. I'm not talking about real esports. I'm getting to the nitty gritty on the business of what makes esports tick. And one thing that we always revisit is how to be profitable in esports. Every episode, I have some whiny chatters come in and say, I don't get it. There's no way to be profitable in esports. Why are these teams doing it? And most of the time, I tell them that teams aren't profitable, but they're hoping to be profitable in the future. Well, I forgot one thing, and that's that there is a beacon of profitability in esports. There is an org out there who is raking in the money, and they're doing it with this one weird trick that will definitely surprise you. I'm talking about FaZe, and the one weird trick is just lying and not paying people. Let's go! The only way to be profitable in esports is to sign contracts verbally and then not pay out. It's actually so simple. Just make a verbal agreement and then don't do the thing that you said you would do. This is the exact opposite of what they did with Tifu, which was a really deep contract that people are saying was unconscionable, that you couldn't sign a child to that contract, that it is unfair and unjust in the state of California. Well, they have since teetered all the way to the other side of the seesaw, and now they're just giving verbal contracts and absolutely reneging on them. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about famous influencer Alyssa Violet, who is alleging that FaZe promised to give her shares in FaZe worth some arbitrary amount of money. Now, if you don't know who Alyssa Violet is, because I didn't, Alyssa Violet is very famous on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, things like that. And she was even more famous in the gaming space for dating FaZe Banks. She was FaZe Banks, uh, owner, not CEO, the, the man in charge, content man in charge, because he's not Lee Trink, CEO of FaZe, of FaZe, FaZe Banks, who I found out today, his real name is Richard. Which is so funny, because could you imagine being on FaZe? Who's that? Oh, that's Richard. Oh, fuck, Richard's so hard, dude. Richard's hitting all the 360 no-scopes. Richard's fucking nasty out there. I can see why he doesn't go by Richard. He goes by fucking Banks. Uh, sorry, I digress. FaZe Banks is dating Alyssa Violet, and they start a few companies together, influencer management companies. This is all in 2017, 2018. They start these companies called... Clout Gang, uh, under a company called Hubrick Limited. Hubrick Limited partner with FaZe Clan to develop businesses, including other businesses. FaZe Clan is just Shell Corp after Shell Corp after Shell Corp so that they can play find the ball cup style and make sure that they're scamming anyone who is trying to make money in it. There's a reason that Alyssa Violet didn't get paid and it's because they set it up in a perfect way to go bankrupt here but keep the FaZe brand clean and strong. When their company they built together went under, Alyssa Violet sued FaZe along with a bunch of other content creators. They said that there was fraud here and they weren't actually getting paid and that this company, Hubrick, didn't get the chance to live. FaZe countersued and said, no, you, you have committed fraud, Alyssa and other people in this company. And so they started suing each other back and forth and back and forth. And then, like most court cases, they settled out of court. Now, according to Alyssa, what happened was FaZe came to her and said, hey, if you drop this lawsuit, we will convert your shares of Hubrick, which are worth nothing, into common shares of FaZe. You will be a part owner of FaZe now, and we can all move on. And Alyssa said, you know what? That seems fair. I'm done with this. Let's completely move on. I will take the shares. Time passes. Years pass. 
It is 2021, and Alyssa Violet still does not have her shares in phase, and she is going, what the fuck? And they are going, Lamau get scammed. They are absolutely dono walling her on these shares. I'm reading transcripts from her lawyer, which is like, hey, they promised her these things. We just want it. That's it. And then I'm listening to the transcripts from FaZe, and FaZe is absolutely gaslighting and obfuscating everything. FaZe's response to this was, hey, when influencers have fights, things get a little crazy. I promise we'll get to the bottom of this. Which doesn't answer, did you promise her shares? And have you paid her shares? It's so simple. Is there any evidence of promising her shares? When you guys settled, was that in the documentation when she signed on the dotted line that I will get these shares? I just think it's so funny that FaZe is always in the spotlight for just absolutely scamming. Just getting down and dirty with content creators. Whether it's Tifu or Alyssa Violet or many others. They had High Sky, the 13-year-old who wasn't even allowed to play Fortnite without his mom on stream signed to a FaZe contract. Wasn't allowed to play in the cash cups. FaZe has made a business around getting sued and it just absolutely sliding off them. I remember distinctly Devin Nash saying this Tifu drama was going to absolutely sink phase. They're not going to be an organization anymore. They're completely out of here. And here they are, not only thriving, but doing the same thing years later to another influencer who just wants what they were promised. And so there's only one thing to say here, chat. Phase up, baby. Let's go. Profitable esports teams. We love to see profitable esports teams because it means that my career was not in vain. Yay. Let's move on to story number two. <clears throat> Let's talk about the esports pyramid chat. So some of you know this. I have built a brand around talking about what we know as the esports pyramid, right? And this is basically just a way of me whining about how shitty it is to be an esports team and how much more valuable it is to be on other parts of the pyramid. The best parts of the pyramid are publishers who make games, sell games, create esports leagues, and control everything. Publishers have the most power. On top of that, you have players and you have influencers, people who get paid for playing the games who maybe can't use all of the mechanisms of owning a game. They can't start their own LCS. They can't do these things, but they get paid a ton of money because they are direct to consumer with their fans. Then you have tournament organizers. Now they are, it's close here. This one's scary because they can actually make a lot of money by selling out to sponsors, but they have to get licenses from publishers to run these events for the games. These are companies like ESL and Flashpoint and PGL and things like that. And the worst part of the pyramid, the shit is running downhill, are esports teams. It fucking sucks to be an esports team. Esports teams have to get licenses from the publishers on the other end of the pyramid to run games. They have to buy in for multi-millions of dollars into these leagues, whether it's LCS or CDL or Overwatch League. They have to pay their players exorbitant salaries because they're all fighting for the same fish in the bucket. And they have to listen to tournament organizers when a tournament organizer says, we have a sponsor that supersedes here. Esports teams get the shit end of the stick. And it's getting worse, listeners. Recently, Complexity signed Tim the Tatman, noted fan of the Dallas Cowboys, and as we all know, the Dallas Cowboys own Complexity. They are giving up their ownership, the one lottery ticket they have in being an esports team, to these players and influencers that already have more value in the ecosystem. Teams are doing anything they can to keep their head above water here. They are trying not to drown, and how are they doing it? By giving away a little bit more of their power, a little bit more of their equity and at the end the esports teams might be successful but they're not going to have that much ownership they're not going to make that much money unfortunately jason lake has had to give some shares to tim the Tatman, and tim the Tatman gets to be an owner gets to support an org while getting all the money of being an influencer and or player on that part of the pyramid i think this sucks so bad this sucks so bad for teams because most teams aren't 100 thieves What's that? I flipped the script. This is a good thing for teams that know how to create content and build a brand as a cultural organization, as a media company, and not as an esports team. For example, Ninja was on Luminosity. 
XQC was on Luminosity. Are people fans of Luminosity? Not that many. Only ones that were fans of their esports teams. But when Ray joined 100 Thieves, or when Nade Shaw started the organization, or when Courage joined, all of a sudden, they got that small bit of equity, but it grew 100 Thieves so much that it was worth it to give them there. Nade Shot and all the rest of the VC funds that bought into 100 Thieves aren't losing because they are growing faster than they are giving the money away. My worry is that an organization like Complexity is not going to be able to utilize Tim the Tapman to grow the company, and they are essentially just giving away value to streamers, and they will make less because of it. Now, if it works, that's exciting. That's really good. I will be very happy if Jason Lake and the Cowboys find a successful esports model through sports teams, because I think that's good. A rising tide lifts all ships. I want esports teams to be profitable, to be happy, and unlike I just said with FaZe, I want them all to work within the letter of the law. I am just worried that they can't do it, and I'm worried that more and more esports teams are going to give away more and more equity until they lose it all, and we still have the same esports teams, and now the owners who put everything on the line get nothing. Now, that is a very biased take from someone who owns an esports org or who has a few shares in an esports org. I don't want more people in. I want to sit on my treasure trove of gold and hope that Gen.G does it. But we'll see. We will see someday. I think that teams are trying to get somewhere else on the pyramid, and they believe that they are moving down by getting more celebrity owners. But the truth is they are just shrinking their portion of the pie and growing the player to influencer portion of the pie. And I'll say it, it has never been a better time to be an influencer. You wonder why I quit my job? Because being a streamer makes more money and you get all the treats. I, I got sponsored. I'm going to get paid for this episode. In a few minutes, I'm going to run a sponsor gambit. They sent me a bunch of free shit and they're paying me for doing this show. I would have done this show for free. I've done it every week. It's crazy talk. All because I'm an influencer and influencers get paid. On to story number three, my favorite section of the show, the clown of the week. <laughs> I just wanted to use a funny picture of Atrioc because this is Atrioc's face whenever I bring up what I'm about to bring up. Chat, I gotta say it. Overwatch is dead, dude. I, it's like literally beating a dead horse. I talk about it every other episode. Overwatch is dead. It was dead last week, but we dug up the body, we burned it, and we threw it back in. Overwatch 2 has no shot because their executive producer, Chaco Sunny, the heir apparent to Jeff Kaplan, the only reason that we thought Jeff leaving might be okay has left the company. And this is in the most vital time. We are at an inflection point for Overwatch. Overwatch 2 is going to launch with the Overwatch League next year. They need this game to be successful so that they can turn everything around in light of tons of drama about sexual harassment, abuse, nepotism, sexism, ageism, racism within their company, and the person who is supposed to be the captain. Stewarding the ship and leading them to safer waters has left the company. You know, I thought that maybe Overwatch was making a comeback because if you don't know, two of their sponsors, uh, Comcast, Xfinity, and Coca-Cola, came back for the playoffs. I was looking at YouTube viewership and playoffs had like 70,000 viewers, which is not a huge amount of viewers, but at least there's something. You got sponsors, you got gamers, you have some viewers, but with the person who is supposed to create the next big thing, leaving your company, and with no one wanting to join your company because they've heard that you're all pieces of shit, I don't think that they can turn it around. And I'm sorry, Atriac, don't look at me like that because I had to say it again, Overwatch, as an esport is dead. Fast segment, but I really wanted to say it. I think I get so much Overwatch news every so often, and it's always negative. I haven't gotten, maybe I'm just looking in the wrong places. I haven't gotten any positive Overwatch news. It seems like, oh, they're going to skip half the season. And oh, they don't know if they're going to play Overwatch 1 or 2. And oh, this person just left. And it's never, oh, this game was really hype. I really enjoyed watching Player One style on Player Two. It's always so shitty, which feels bad. Especially because we are in playoffs for Overwatch right now. C'est la vie. Rest in peace. I will kind of miss you. I was, I was actually watching. When I said I checked YouTube to see viewership, I watched a little bit of the playoffs. And it was kind of cool. 
Like, Overwatch is kind of a fun game. You know what I mean? I would love to huff the copium. I would love to believe that it's going to be good, but it's not. It's going to be very bad. It's going to die. And whether Overwatch 2 has a season in the league won't matter. Because I think that it's on so... The momentum towards failure is so strong right now that no matter how good the game is, it is going straight into the earth. Rest in peace. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what we do after the stories. We go to the viewer Q&A. But wait, what's that in the distance? Is that a sponsor? Let me pull up my script here. This episode of The Stan Show is brought to you by Manscaped. Let's go. They're paying me money. The show is good. Quick Dome doesn't have to eat beans today. Support for The Stand Show is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Crazy that you wrote that, Manscaped. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawn Mower 4.0. And let's just say, I got a lawn down there. Thank God I got this. The Lawn Mower 4.0, you heard that right, the 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer. For you, 20% off and worldwide shipping with code STANS. Just go to manscaped.com and use code STANS. Now, they told me, after I say that, that this is not a parody ad. This is real. They're, they they paid me money. Go use my code and buy a ball trimmer. Or some of the other cool stuff they sent me. I used some ball deodorant today, chat. They didn't even pay me for this part. Because I'm a I'm a sweaty guy. I do the stand show here. And this is, this is good. <laughs> they also sent me ball perfume. You know, it's not often that people say, man, your balls are kind of stinky. But now they'll never say it. You know, on the one chance that my balls are stinky, they won't be anymore. So they told me to give an anecdote. Tell me something about shaving. And I was looking through their ideas for anecdotes. And this is actually really embarrassing. I think starting with an embarrassing anecdote is how you get them to rebuy in because they'll see that I'm committed to the brand. I have never had two shavers. I've always shaved my balls with my same shaver that I shave my face. I just wash it. I just wash it. Is that crazy? Do you guys do that? This is the first time in my life with the lawnmower 2.0 4.0, sorry, this is the lawnmower 4.0, that I've had a separate one, which is kind of cool. I'm an animal? Hey, whatever, man. I think it's cool. So it's really nice. It's actually really good. One of the best parts is that it has a light on it, and so you can shave your grundle if you really need to. I will say that I've never been cleaner, and now I don't have to put this on my face after shaving my taint, which is sick. Let's go. They sent me a bunch of other stuff, a shirt. I've only used the razor the ball deodorant and the ball spray, but it's, hey, it's good. It's, it's really good. So make sure that you get 20% off and free shipping with code stands at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code stands. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Wow. We did it. Free ad. Are you showing us your used razor? Yeah, this was on my balls. You like that? Ugh, you don't want to touch it. You don't want to touch it. <laughs> SMH. I could have saved 20% and got free shipping. Uh, they told me if a lot of people use the code, they will sponsor me again. So it's up to you. If you <laughs> I, the product is actually good. So if you need something for down there, go for it. Grip it and rip it. Code stands. Ladies and gentlemen, now that that is over, let's get into the Q&A. This is the section of the podcast where you get to ask me questions. And if you're watching this for the first time, the way that you ask me questions is by leaving comments on the most recent episode of The Stand Show on YouTube. So these questions were left on my last episode. I thought they were good. I thought they were topical. I thought they would be fun to answer. So I'm going to answer them right now. <clears throat> Is it better for the competitive scene of a game to look like Melee in that pro players are using tech like wave dashing that casuals simply can't? Or more like Valorant where the best teams are making better decisions and performing more precisely, but using the same options as casuals? This is a really interesting question because I think at the heart of this question is what should the skill floor be for video games and how visible should the skill floor be, right? Should it be obvious how hard something is or should we have to try it to figure it out? Now, I think Melee is a very interesting game where it is not obvious how hard a lot of the things are. For example, you will see people wave land and shield drop and all you really see is people moving quickly around the stage. You don't realize how hard it is until you try to do it, until you realize that you need to, what's the manscape code? Stands. Sorry, I'm not going to interrupt it again. The code is stands. S-T-A-N-Z stands. 
You don't realize how hard melee is until you try and do it. When you don't L cancel things and everything is slow and you can't move and nothing is happening good. And so I think that is cool. It is a game that looks good, looks fast. I can tell that players are doing things. And then when I try it, I realize that the skill floor for professional play is very high. Pros make it look easy to wave dash back, grab ledge, back air off stage, up be back on, things like that. And then you have games, so the example that the chatter gave was Valorant, where it doesn't look that different from what I am doing, besides them clicking on heads a little bit more. They are using Phoenix Flashes around a wall. The Sage is walling on Icebox in the same place that I wall. And so you get to learn how quickly they do the things, or how sharp their aim is, and like a little bit of things. Now, I am not a game designer, so I won't pause it which is better for sales or better for esports. But I do think what is most important is that what we see is impressive. It's one of the reasons that I think Melee is a very fun spectator sport, because we can watch a player zoom around, even in a different way to something like Street Fighter where they're not drawing a combo. I am also personally more interested in games like Marvel vs. Capcom, because they're bringing in other characters, they're moving high, they're moving low, they're mixing up. You look at things like Guilty Gear nowadays, and those are really exciting to me, because I can understand how they're moving and schmoving by hitting buttons. It's a lot more difficult, and this is a conversation I've had with a few of my friends, like uh, Dr. Battle has brought this up a few times when we're talking about Task Manager. He doesn't understand top 10 esports plays because they will show Dota, and he doesn't have the context for it. You can understand a Ken dragon punching someone on Wake Up, and it's like, oh, he punched him in the face very hard, but I can't understand that this Earthshaker just blinked into Roche while they were doing it, hit an Echo Slam, all of a sudden they're all dead, the game turned around and they won. Because I don't know what his abilities do, or that he had a blink dagger, or that these things happen. I think that it is a real challenge for the MOBA genre that they can't do that. And it's a reason why more casual gamers in the last, let's call it four years, maybe three, four, have gravitated towards BRs or even social information games. You understand when Valkyrie stabs corpse, she's the imposter. She killed him. Now she is going to lie and say he is this thing. And I know Among Us isn't necessarily an esport, but I think that gameplay loop of watching and understanding is really important. So the question for esports is where should that floor be? How much should be hidden or how much should require playing the game? And I think for a wide casual scene, you want as little of that as possible. You want everyone to understand what is happening and to see the hype moments. But for an esport that stands the test of time, like Melee, you need the depth of skill to be extremely deep, right? Otherwise, people wouldn't be playing it for 20 years. They would move on to other games, or it would be Dive Kick, where it's fun, but kind of a gimmick. Okay, we've already, we understand the game here. So again, maybe I put my foot in my mouth, maybe I don't understand it, but I believe that a game visually should be extremely easy to understand, especially in a clip format. If you're showing me a clip of League of Legends, like Faker versus, you know, the Zed fight that Faker had, I can kind of understand that two ninjas are flipping around and that's cool, but I don't necessarily understand an Earthshaker jumping in and hitting the ground and stealing Roche, right? There are some things that are really hard. But you want people to get drawn in by that ease of access, play with their friends, here's the fun part, and then stay in the hardcore esports section because they're learning lineups and things like that. CSGO has a really good one. Hey, this guy is going to swing a corner and try and shoot them in the head, and then as I learn more, oh, I need to learn mollies and smokes and things like that. In Valorant, oh, I need to learn post-plant lineups, and all of a sudden the game gets deeper, which is really interesting and really cool, right? You don't need to know how the NBA has changed over the years to understand that like a three-pointer is cool or a dunk is cool, a steal is cool. But as you get into the game, you might understand different formations or sets or that a certain player is really good at a certain thing and other players statistically are way far behind. And that makes it really fun to be a fan, which is cool. And our second question to close out the show, Dear Staniel, in a recent episode, this is like a World War II letter, Dear Staniel, in a recent episode, you mentioned that Mango is now the undisputed GOAT of Melee. What is, in your opinion, the criteria to become the GOAT of a given game? And what are examples from other games? Yours sincerely, a Spotify listener. Yeah, I did mention that Mango is the GOAT. He won the largest prize pool tournament in Super Smash Bros. Melee, and he has won large tournaments a decade apart. 
I think that the GOAT discussion is almost always an exercise in futility in traditional sport because they have gone on so long that comparing eras is extremely difficult. Like the basic one is Michael Jordan versus LeBron. But if you go even further back, you have people talking about Bill Russell or Wilt Chamberlain. It is impossible to talk about comparing different eras and it becomes a my favorite player is my favorite player because of this emotional factor and is better than your favorite player. The cool thing about esports is most of the games have been alive for such a short amount of time that I can unequivocally say that Faker is the GOAT of League of Legends. He qualified for the World Championship again. He has won the World Championship multiple times. Until other players do more than him, there is no world where you could convince me that another player is the GOAT. Right? We talk about Prime Astralis in CSGO as being the GOAT team because they won so many majors. What was it, a four out of five? Or, or they won three out of four, something like that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm out of practice because Astralis has been so shit lately that they've upset me, right? It's very easy to look at a team that is winning all of the championships and say they are the GOAT. But if CSGO is around in 30 years, all of a sudden our new teams doing new things that look crazy, we say there's no way Astralis could hang with them. If they played today, the new team would win. Of course. Now, Melee is a game that has been around for the perfect amount of time because for almost all of Melee's history, Mango has been a main character. He has been a protagonist. Now, obviously, we can take the Ken time out. We can take the, the as in the chillin' dude, some of the early East versus West stuff. When the game got serious, Mango was a top competitor. When the Dot Kids came in, Mango was a top competitor. When Zane rose up, Mango was a top competitor. And now that we are in the COVID online era, Mango is a top competitor. Mango has won more tournaments, more times over more years than anyone. And this is coming from someone who used to be an Armada is the GOAT truther. Armada retired from the game and Mango kept going. Mango established his dominance with the two factors of being a GOAT, which is winning and time. If you win a lot and you do it over a long amount of time, those are the only two things that matter. People will talk about strength of competition, but we can't compare those so it doesn't really matter. And we look at esports players that are the GOAT. I think that Faker is the GOAT of League of Legends. Maybe that will change in the future. Mango is the GOAT of Melee. Grubby is probably, maybe there's some moon stands out there. Grubby is the GOAT of Warcraft 3. There's some games that don't have GOATs because they've gone on for too long. You talk about... Ah, there's just there's just so many. Maybe Flash in Brood War. Uh, you could talk about you know Savior pre match fixing. Let's say he didn't match fix. Maybe there's one of those, one of those bourgeois who makes it. So while it's fun to talk about Criterion for being a goat, it is impossible to get there. And the one thing that I beseech of you is that don't actually get upset about these conversations because it is just screaming at a dono wall. You know what I mean? If you truly believe that Armada is the GOAT, you will not convince a Mango Goater. If you truly believe Mango is the GOAT, you will not convince a Hungrybox Goater. You know, it's just, at this point, it is just, I think my favorite player is the best. Here are the tournaments he has won over the course of time. If you don't agree with me, that's okay. But for me, Mango is the GOAT. Faker is the GOAT, Grubby is the GOAT, and I like to think about different GOATs of different games. I hope that my dream is that in 15 years, 10 years, we'll have a new GOAT. My dream is that Zayn gets better and starts beating everyone, and then new kids come up in Melee, and Zayn is beating them, and Zayn is still beating people, and all of a sudden, there's a podcaster who's young and saying, like, of course Zayn is the GOAT. Anyone who thinks Mango is the GOAT is living in the past. Anyone who says Isaiah didn't try and if he tried to be the GOAT is a boomer in the same way that my dad talks about fucking Connie Hawkins and Bill Russell, right? It's a fun conversation across generations and will hopefully create storylines for players to talk across generations about who their favorite players were. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to this episode of The Stan Show. Make sure you check out the episode live on YouTube, I presume tomorrow, on Spotify soon after that. I will be doing a bonus episode of this show tomorrow, Friday the 24th, where I review everything that happened in Valorant in Berlin with Sean Gares, who was an analyst at the event and former IGL for North American Counter-Strike teams such as... Um, Cloud9. He also played for Misfits for a while, which was really cool. Uh, he did some awesome things. So that's going to be fun. We're going to talk about Valorant. We're going to shoot the shit. We're going to do it all. Last but not least, make sure you go to manscaped.com. Use promo code STANDS. They will give me money. I love you guys. See you next time.